God is groaning of his precious blood's atoning, and I repent it of my. <clears throat> built for me in glory and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels of singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood, beneath the cleansing blood. Amen. Welcome to the Sunday morning service of the Grace Baptist Church of Melbourne, Florida. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew in chapter 8. And our scripture reading will be verses 23 through 27. Begin reading with verse 23. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waters. But he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea Obey him. Christ earlier had given commandment to his disciples to depart to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. In verse 18, a verse that we looked at last week, and saw that they were to depart to the other side of the sea. They were to begin preparations and here in our passage this morning, preparations are complete and they set sail to the other side of the sea. Now this leaving and departing to the other side of the sea was in part to escape the multitudes and get some rest as well as to try to prove his disciples, and to increase the faith of his disciples. But it was also because he must go to the country of the gatherings. Even though he knew 
that he would face opposition there in the country of the Gadarenes. He chose, he chose, Jesus chose, the Son of Man chose to go across the sea. Was there not another way to get to the country of the Gadarenes from where he was at Capernaum? They could have walked around the Sea of Galilee. It wasn't as large a body of water as the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific or even the Mediterranean Sea which would have been more in their locality. It was a small sea. In fact, some call it the Lake of Genesaret or the Sea of Galilee. They could have walked around the sea and avoided that storm. But then he would not have opportunity to manifest his power as God, having power over the winds and the waves, over his creation. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful to know that when we face the storms of life, we have one to go to, Amen. one who can calm the storm. His disciples followed him. He was leading them. He, he got into the boat first, and they followed him in to the boat. The true disciples of Christ follow him. The twelve kept close to him. All of his journeys, the twelve were there. They were with him. Even, they followed him even to his death and even followed him to their death. Think about that. They stayed close to him. They followed him. They were his true disciples. They manifested that they were called of him. The true disciples of Christ follow him wherever he leads. Wherever he leads. You'll find his true disciples following him. Now let us take notice this morning, first of all, of the danger and the uncertainty. Yes, the disciples of Christ face uncertain danger. Danger abounds on every hand and uncertain of the outcome thereof. And, and this was on the heels of his revelation to the scribe that if you're looking for wealth and prosperity and blessings of this life, not necessarily as a follower of Christ. For in verse 20 of, of the passage we looked at last week, he said, And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Now this was a great storm. 
No doubt about it. And we here in Florida, we've experienced some great storms called hurricanes. It seems as though this storm may have been a type of whirlwind. It seems to have been a storm caused by a very great wind. Maybe not necessarily any rain at all, maybe not, none. As living here on the seacoast, we know what strong winds do to the seas. Strong winds with, without any rain and lightning and, and, and thunder, uh, strong winds can produce great swelling waves in a body of water. In the book of Mark in chapter 4, and in the reading there in verse 37, it says, a great storm of wind. A great storm of wind. In the book of Luke in chapter 8 and, and verse 23, the other counterpart says a storm of wind. And I read uh, by those who have studied it and are to know that the, that the way the Sea of Galilee was situated there and the mountain ranges that were there on the, the north and east, east of the Sea of Galilee, those winds would, would sweep down in over those mountains and down across that sea and produce violent waves. And so it appears that this was the type of storm that this was, a windstorm. But it produced great swelling waves. Waves that were boisterous. boisterous. Waves that were, were tossing up over the ship and into the and, and the ship was taking water on. Certainly, Jesus could have prevented the storm. If he had power over nature, if he had power to calm it, he had power to prevent it, did he not? But what would that have accomplished as far as his purpose was concerned? You see, that wasn't his purpose to prevent it. His purpose was to allow it. In the book of, of John in, in chapter 11, in, in verse 4 there, uh, con Jesus told his disciples concerning uh, Lazarus. He said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. You see? And that was, that was the purpose in allowing this storm on the Sea of Galilee at that particular time when they were crossing. So that the Son of God and the Son of Man might be glorified. This was so that, that God might be glorified. Listen, storms will come. That's for certain. That's a certainty. And to put it in the words of the songwriter, sometimes he calms the storm, and sometimes he calms me in the midst of the storm. Have you experienced that? The calming effects of the Savior? Turn with me to the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms in chapter 107. Psalms 107, and look at verse 28. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. 
So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. You see, sometimes he calms me out of all my distresses, of all those storms. He calms me. And I'm to praise him because he gave me calm in the midst of the storm. And sometimes he calms the storm. And I'm to praise him for his goodness to me. We're to praise him. How sweet. How sweet it is to know that I'm in the ship with him. I'm in the boat with him. I'm not in there alone. He's, he's there with me. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah in chapter 4. Isaiah 4 and verse 6. And there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge and for a covert from storm and from rain. Are you in the tabernacle? <laughs> Are you in that place of refuge? Are you in that place of safety? Do you faith, feel safe in Jesus this morning? 2 Jesus is asleep in the storm. Yes, it's a great storm. And, and yes, they were, in the, they were in the ship with Jesus, the one who had performed miracles, the one who had displayed mighty power in those miracles. And they were in the ship with him, but he's asleep. Jesus was asleep in the ship in the midst of the storm. He's asleep. How, how, can, how can he sleep? How can a man sleep through a storm such as this? I mean, the, the, the ship is being tossed to and fro. The waves are coming over. It's taking on water. And there's a man asleep in it. And Jesus slept to show that he was really and truly man and he was subject to the, the weaknesses of the body as a man. He grew tired. He grew weary. This was the end of a long day. And Jesus, Jesus was asleep. He had no fears, no qualms. <laughs> Why, he was the master of nature. He had created it. He had been the director of that storm. You would say the cause of that storm. In Jesus, we can rest. In Jesus, we can rest. And we can rest quietly in the storms and distresses of life. The psalmist said in, in the book of Psalms in chapter 4 and verse 8, he said, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. You see, see where the psalmist's confidence was? His confidence was in the Lord. Is your confidence in the Lord this morning? In the book of Acts, in the 12th chapter there, Herod had 
just had James the Apostle put to death. And he saw that it pleased the Jews. It made the Jews very happy. And so he proceeded to take Peter. And Peter was cast into prison. He was bound hand and foot. And he was between two soldiers. And in the sixth verse there we find Peter sound asleep. <laughs> in the midst of that storm, <laughs> knowing that, that Herod had just had James, his friend, <laughs> an apostle, put to death him. And now his intent was to do the same with Peter. And he bowed hand and foot and between two soldiers in that dungeon. And he's fast asleep. <laughs> oh, there's comfort. There's comfort in the Lord. We can rest quietly in him. Then consider the terror. Okay, we got a great storm. And Jesus is, yes, he's in the ship, but, but he's asleep. And so they were terrified. They were terrified. In fact, there were other men there besides the apostles. Probably the, they were called the mariners of the ship. It seems to have been these ships were leased vehicles to go out and, and, and they would do their fishing. And, and, but anyhow, men that navigated the ship. In fact, Mark and Luke just refer, refer no distinction between certain men and the apostles. It's just they that were in the ship. And so there's no distinction. Matthew makes a distinction between them. We'll deal with that a little bit later. But they were afraid. Probably all that were in the ship were afraid. Now consider these disciples. At least four of them were experienced fishermen of the Sea of Galilee. In fact, it appears that, that six of them or at least of two of the four and, and two others of the apostles were from the same town, Bethsaida, which is a seaport, which is a seacoast. It's on the northeastern tip of the Sea of Galilee. So whether Philip and Nathaniel, Philip and Bartholomew were fishermen or not, doesn't say, we're not told. But we know that, that Peter and Andrew and James and John were of the Sea of Galilee. And so they would have been acquainted with the types of storms that came to the Sea of Galilee. But it didn't matter. All their experience and having faced other storms in the past. Maybe this was worse than any storm they had witnessed before. They were afraid. It was a great storm. And they were in great fear. They were in terror. So they ran to the Lord. And I said, Mark and Luke doesn't make a distinction who ran to the Lord. But Matthew tells us that his disciples went to him. His disciples ran to him. Notice their petition. Lord, save us. Lord, Lord, save us. We belong to you. We're yours. Now save us. <laughs> what did they mean in that? Well, they believed he had the power. They believed he could. They had witnessed his miracles. 
His miracles of healing that He had done. They prayed that He would save them. They just weren't certain that He would. <laughs> As I studied that and thought about that, I thought, oh, how often am I just like that? We're just like that. We know he can. If he will, we're just not sure whether he will or not. Yes, we're just like these disciples. We see their petition was, Lord, save us. Their plea. They pleaded, we perish. We perish. Which, you consider we perish, it is the language of fear. They were afraid. They were terrified. They looked at their present situation as hopeless, one of certain death if the Lord didn't intervene. It's also the language of urgency. Urgency. We perish. The Lord save us. We perish. I mean, there's urgency in that, is there not? Their prayer was in earnest, and it was a begging for their lives. <laughs> Jesus had just instructed them, had he not? In the Sermon on the Mount, instructed them as to earnestness, persistence in prayer. The seventh chapter of the book of Matthew in verse 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. <laughs> See? Yeah. When the circumstances are dire, when they're urgent, all oh, persist in prayer to the Lord. Persist in prayer to the Lord. Chapter 21 of the book of Matthew, Jesus says this sometime later. In chapter 21 and in verse 22, he said to his disciples here, he said, um, Matthew 20, 21 and verse 22. Uh, well, let's read verse 21 as well. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, Ye shall not only do this, which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, believing, <laughs> ye shall receive. So the Lord had told them about prayer in chapter 7 and the necessity for persistence in prayer. But let's go on. We want to notice, secondly, the power of the man called Jesus. The man called Jesus. First of all, we notice the danger and the uncertainty of that danger. But now notice the power of this man called Jesus. They woke him up as a man. He grew tired. He grew weary. He needed sleep. Certainly he was exhausted after the long day, delivering a, a sermon such as, as the one to, that recorded in, in chapters 5, 6, and 7. 
after the miracles which he performed? Certainly. He's tired. In the book of John and in chapter 4 where, where Jesus must needs go through Samaria because he had an appointment at the well of Jacob. It says that, that as they got to the well of Jacob, he was wearied from his journey. And he sat on the well. Yes, those, those are, are traits and characteristics of the human body. It grows weary. It gets tired. And it needs rest. It needs sleep. But as God, Jesus the man was in the ship and he was asleep. But as God, he never sleeps. You see, Jesus was, was 100% man, but he was 100% God. And so even though the body was asleep in the ship, God was not asleep. We're told in the book of Psalms in chapter 121 and verse 4, Behold, he that keepeth Israel, he that keepeth his people shall neither slumber, as grow, grow dreary, grow drowsy, nor sleep. <laughs> That's a great comfort, is it not? Even, even though it may appear that he's asleep, he doesn't sleep. He doesn't grow tired. He's not a man like you and I. Notice that he rebuked the disciples. Notice his rebuke of the disciples. He said, why are ye fearful? O ye of little faith. Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? If I, your Lord and Master, am able to rest, why can't you? Why can't you? Don't you know that even when I appear to be sleeping, I'm awake? For I never slumber nor sleep. He's displeased. Jesus is displeased with their fear. He said, why are you fearful? Why are you fearful? Child of God this morning, I asked, why are we fearful? You're my disciples. You're following me. If you're following me, <laughs> you have no reason to fear. Let the heathen, let the sinners be afraid. But not my disciples. My disciples are to be resting in me. Turn with me to the book of Proverbs and in Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 25 where we read, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. <laughs> oh, the promises of God's word. He doesn't slumber or sleep. There's safety in the Lord. <laughs> We're in the ship with him. We're trusting in him. <laughs> There's safety in him. Do you feel safe? Do you feel secure? You should. And he reveals 
he reveals to his disciples, his true disciples, the reason, the cause of their fears. He said, O ye of little faith. O ye of little faith. In the book of Luke, in chapter 8, verse 25, Luke's rendition there, he says, Where's your faith? Mark, chapter 4, he says, Ye have no faith. <laughs> o ye of little faith. Where's your faith? You have no faith. They had faith. They had faith in Jesus Christ. They were a follower of Jesus Christ. But their faith was little. There was little in that it did not extend to this circumstance, to this storm. In this storm, they exhibited no faith. That is at least for deliverance from the storm. They had no faith. They had enough faith in Jesus to know who to go to, but they did not have faith that he would deliver them from the storm. At times, we, the disciples of Christ, are troubled when the storms come. And we see nothing but a bleak outcome. Yeah. That's why my doctor says you have cancer and it's so devastating to us. Or some other dreaded disease or some other problem, some other storm. And in, in the midst of that storm, we, we don't see a certain outcome. Things are bleak. Our faith is weak. When it should be the anchor of our soul. By faith we would keep our eyes upon Jesus. By faith we'll keep our eyes upon Jesus. And when we do that, the storms of life look pretty small. Because Jesus is great. Jesus is great. And what's the storm in comparison to Jesus? Why, he permitted the storm. He steers the storm. Whithersoever he will, he turns it. You see. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 19 says, Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. That, that hope, which is a product of our faith, which is the gift given to us. Oh, it's sure. And it's steadfast. It's certain. You see, God which promised cannot lie. The unbelief of these disciples and our unbelief is the cause of our fear. And I submit to you this morning that it's not pleasing to the Lord. He says to us, why are ye so fearful? Why are you so fearful? His rebuke of the wind. He rebuked the disciples, and then he rebukes the wind and the waves. He's the sovereign one. He's the sovereign one. He's sovereign over man. 
as was shown in his rebuke of his disciples. And he's sovereign over nature as is shown in his rebuke of the wind and the waves. Psalms 65. Psalms chapter 65. Psalm 65 and look at verse 5. By terrible things in righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of them that are afar off upon the sea, which by his strength settle fast the mountains. being girded with power, which stilleth the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the people. <laughs> you see, he stills it. He's the sovereign over his creation. He makes firm the mountains, he calms the noise of the seas. <laughs> and he calms me of my distresses. The ease by which it was done. It was done by the power of his word. The very power of his word. Look with, with me at, at the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews in chapter 1. In verse 1, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appeared, appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. This Jesus, his son, the son of God, upholding all things by the word of his power. When he by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Notice the effect. Yes, he spoke the word. He re spoke the word of rebuke. He rebuked his creation. He rebuked nature. He rebuked the winds and the waves. Notice the effects. There was a great calm. It wasn't just calm. It was a great calm. I've been in instances which generally indicate the pre which are generally there preceding a storm when it becomes what what I would say eerie eerily calm it's so calm it's eerie and that's what I get out of this great calm he, he spoke the word and there was a great calm such as is not normal. It was so calm. Christ but speaks the word. And there's great calm. I've experienced such calmness in the midst of storm. I can't explain it other than it's God giving me peace. God speaking the word. And there's calm. Great calm. The wind ceases. That's the effect. The effects of, of his speaking the word of his power. The wind cease. And the effects, the waves cease also. Which are the effects of the wind blowing. You see? So he calms both. 
Then lastly, notice the astonishment. The astonishment. It says in our text in verse 27, but the men marveled. The men marveled. They were afraid and they marveled. Fear turned into wonder. Fear turned in to wonderment. You see, the men marveled. This seems to be the mariners of the ship. As I said earlier, Mark and Luke don't give a distinction between disciples and, and the other men. Matthew gives you a distinction. And this seems to be the mariners of the ship. I, I don't think that it was the disciples. And here's the reason why I don't think it was the disciples. Because previously in these verses, he made reference to the disciples and called them disciples. And here he's making reference to, I think, the other men besides the disciples. He's referencing the men, the mariners of the ship that were on board. Now, there is an indication in this. And that is that, that it would indicate to me that we are resting in Christ. And he calms the storms of life. And people all around us behold the storms that we're experiencing and the calmness with which we go through them. And they marvel. They're amazed. They're astonished <laughs> at the calmness to go through those storms. And the only way I can explain it to them is saying, it's the peace that he gives. And only he gives. They were amazed at, at this man, a man such as they were. What command? What power that he manifested that even nature obeyed him. He said, the winds and the waves, the sea, this wind and the sea obey him. They had witnessed. He taught as one having authority. He healed the incurable. He healed the chronically ill and from afar off. He healed. He was touched by his, the infirmities of his people. His followers forsake all to follow him. He is the sovereign of heaven and earth. Ask, O wicked Nebuchadnezzar, one whom God changed. And after the end of his days, he said, I extol him. He's sovereign. Who, who could stop him from doing as he pleases in heaven and on earth? There's none. I say to you this morning, Trust him. Trust him. Trust him, first of all, with your soul. With your soul's destination. Do you trust Jesus? That is, do you have faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? And that's all you need. Amen. That's the only thing that can save you, pull you out of your sins and your trespasses. It's the only thing that can give you everlasting life. To put it in the words of Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Are you trusting Jesus this morning? 
Psalm 37 and verse 5 says, Commit thy ways unto the Lord. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him. And he shall bring it to pass. What? He'll bring eternal life to pass. He'll give you that peace in the midst of the storm. To those that are already saved, are you trusting him in the storms of life? Are you trusting him in the present storm? That so many are fearful and, and many Christians are fearful of today. Are you trusting him? Psalms 56 and verse 3 says, What time I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. I will trust in thee. When those times of fear and doubt come, and they will, trust in the Lord. Trust in him. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that you've given salvation unto I, not because I was deserving, but because it pleased you to do so. And you've given me a peace, a peace that I cannot explain, but I'm so glad that it is present with me. I'm so glad that your mercies are there every day. For, Father, I need them. I'm still a sinner. And your mercies are there. You're withholding your condemnation from me. I deserve it. And not only are they here today, I am assured that tomorrow when I awake from my bed, if I awake, they'll be there with me tomorrow. Because you said it would be so. Oh, I have great reason this morning to trust in you. Calm all my fears, all my anxieties, and help me rest in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.